Thank you very much, Richard. Um, yeah, if he dials in, I'll make sure he doesn't get too chatty in the background there and take away my fame. Okay, um, welcome to this afternoon's presentation. Um, lovely to see the people, a lot of the people who attended last week are here again this week. So it is um, part two in a series, and then next week we'll be looking at um, how we can proactively manage absence and some things we can put in place um, before we get to the absence to help our organisations. Um, so yeah, welcome everybody. Um, a lot of you will have listened to me before looking on, on the, the list of attendees, but welcome to anybody new. Um, about me, um, as, as you may know or may not know, I'm an HR professional. I um, run a consultancy called Red Elephant HR, um, and I also have a training organisation called the Business Springboard, where I work with colleagues um, to deliver mainly management and leadership training interventions, particularly myself around um, people, management and leadership, as well as some softer skills. Um, some of you might um, hopefully want to engage with us shortly that we'll be um, sent uh, will be on our website. Um, we're relaunching our, launching our HR law and practice seminars um, in on a new platform using the same platform. This is something that ran quite successfully as open um, seminars where people joined us in a physical venue. But as obviously that limits on location, we start that off on an email basis. And I present those with an employment lawyer, Claire Alston, um, who is, um, well, I feel she's, she's excellent in what she does, but we work quite well together and receive excellent feedback of Claire doing the legal side and myself doing the practical application. So those will, those will be starting from next month, um, run on a bi-monthly basis. So any HR professionals amongst you who want to keep up to date, but not just hear the legal side, but also the application of new bits of case law, employment law areas, et cetera, et cetera, then hopefully I'll see you on that. So, okay. Also, my standard disclaimer and copyright, the copyright is to the business springboard and any information that I give you in these presentations is not directed to a specific problem that you may have. Okay, formalities out of the way. Now, what we're going to talk to you about, well, as anybody who's listened to me before and particularly from last week will know that absence is a very key topic area of, um, of mine that I really um, have quite a passion about. It's something that I did an awful lot of research on in my studies um, to gain HR qualifications. And it's something that I just find quite fascinating of being a people manager, that it's something in business that's quite accepted. Um, but there's so much that we can do. And one of those def um, distinctions that I wanted to bring in this series is this difference between long-term and short-term absence, because they do have very different impacts on the business. Um, and they also have very different obligations and um, ways to be managed from ourselves as management and HR professionals. Um, last week, I put a slide up on of how much absence costs us, and I think that's still relevant here, but one thing that I did point out on there, that absence, average absence in the UK is um, six days. Now, obviously, that takes into long-term and short-term absences, and there will be a big mix in there. Um, I don't have any sort of breakdown of what that may mean. However, um, we need to keep that at the front of our minds, really, that six days is an average. So that wouldn't necessarily fall into my long-term, but averages sometimes aren't the best um, median calculation to say you know, how this occurs, but very different ways of managing long-term and short-term. So, um, firstly, today I want to talk about defining what this long-term absence is. And then, now this isn't a legal seminar, um, but obviously it plays a part in it. So I'm going to talk about the legal requirements and DDA considerations, because they form a big bit of managing absence, but I want to turn that into the practical side. Okay, so moving on from that, some practical steps to help you manage long-term absence and some solutions and resolutions there at the end of how we might, you know, what we want to get to as an end game in this management. Um, anything that I talk to in all of management, performance management, absence management, is about restoring things to an acceptable level. And that's exactly what we're looking to in absence management. It's not about big sticks. You know, last week I talked about reward and punishment for short-term absence. Ultimately, we need to get attendance to where it needs to be, which is why a lot of the time I do talk on the positive side of attendance management rather than absence management. Okay. So, 
this distinction between long and, and short-term absence, and I, I want to pose this question, what causes the most disruption? And please do use the chat box now um, to give me your thoughts in your organisations where you have the most problems. Is it long-term long absence or short-term absence? Now, long-term is often very visible. We see it because um, John, who usually sits um, at the desk in front of us, is missing for a couple of months. Um, so it's very visible and can be sometimes lost in amongst, well, you know, um, short-term people that have odd days off. Disruption to the business, I would feel that short-term absence actually cause the most disruption. However, if you have somebody doing a role that there isn't, um, uh, that they have only skills to do it, then obviously long-term absence is going to cause a big disruption to your business as well. Um, so it depends on what you do. Um, yeah, interesting that Carol's posed that short-term absence in manufacturing. I would quite expect that in manufacturing. And it does, if, you know, my research that I've gone into and in speaking to clients, it's a short-term that causes mass disruption. Funny enough, it's a long-term that can, um, it can have a lot more cost, also cannot, um, but it's losing some key skills out of our business, and we have to look at that quite differently. So there's still... Um, a lot of, um, of of issues to, to look at, but yeah, short term in in hospitality, Caroline, I would expect that as, as well. You know, certain industry sectors will see higher um, levels of sickness absence. So we talked last week about how to measure short term absence, and that's a lot around the procedure that you have in place um, that you get people to telephone in um, directly when they're calling in sick, return to work um, interviews, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Long-term absence, I'm going to look at it slightly differently because we have to look at different measures to manage it and some disability discrimination um, uh, um, considerations too. And it, it's quite funny because I, I, um, I think with long-term, sometimes the out-of-sight, out-of-mind can happen. And it's one of those things where you know, managers are doing the, the daily job and getting on with running that business. And we kind of put this person who's on long-term sick out of our minds in a way and leave it there. I once um, went to do some work with a company and I was looking at the employee list and I went down this list and I had somebody at, at the bottom. I'm like, where's this person here? You know, I haven't seen them around. Nobody's mentioned them. Are oh, they on long-term sick? Right, okay, how long has it been off for? Um, it's just gone four years now. <laughs> and what? Well, it doesn't cost us anything. Actually, it does, because even if they've exhausted um, SSP and any com company sick pay that you um, pay, they still accrue on holiday, and that's a key thing. So you're paying 5.6 um, weeks per year um, in salary to that person. But at the end of the day as well, it's not good management practice. You've got somebody sat at home that they probably forgot exactly how the company works and what they actually meant to do and, and are they doing something else? Are they still unfit for work? And the role that they're doing, what have you done with it in that four years? So it can be that out of sight, out of mind. So we need to really look at that. Um, Victoria, just reading your comment, both have an effect here, causes issues with cross-training administration, um, loses support from team members. How do we get them back in the learning spirit. Yeah, um, you know, this teamwork that I am going to talk about because that's a, another big thing of mine. Long-term absences is going to change that team and how that's going to have an effect on um, the rest of the people in there. Okay, so how I classify long-term absence um, is anything over four weeks. Um, again, that's up to you to define. Um, this is my definition, and I think in any policy you need to have some sort of definition. Not only in the policy, but your ways to manage need to be, be looked at in that way. The reason why I say four weeks is it's a nice break that usually anything over four weeks will have some medical considerations or reasons. Um, you know, tummy bugs, not going to last you four weeks, I would hope so, I hope, unless it's something more serious. Um, coughs and colds aren't going to last over four weeks, etc., etc. Duvet days should definitely not last over four weeks. Um, so we've got to be careful in those things. Um, yeah, Carol, yours is four weeks too. So it seems to be quite, you know, an accepted standard that anything over four weeks would be a long-term absence. Um, and as I mentioned um, Last week, in, in defining the two, it's very important in how you manage that absence. Um, I think I gave an example last week of an organization where I had one person who'd been off, um, I've got the figures in front of me now, but around 38 days and somebody else who'd had six days off. And I had the harder conversation with the person who had six days off because of Friday, Mondays, odd one-offs. The 36 days or 38 days, whatever that was in that example, was due to a longer-term illness and operation, etc. So we've got to look at them a little bit differently. Um, and 
as I said as well, you know, any sickness absence policy should be there, I feel, as a reward, but a key benefit to your loyal long-term employees, which is why I haven't got a problem in a stepped um, entitlement to sick pay, um, to a benefit for them, because we're not machines, we may get ill, and there may be some life events that we have to cater for. Um, so um, the other thing to consider in long term that it may include a cluster of short term absences. Now SSP is linked in pay terms, so the government do that in a link, and we can do that as well and define that in our policy of what that may mean. So if somebody is off two days one week, three days the next, and then they're off for four week, for three weeks. I would class that as a long-term absence because I would put a link into that, that they were together, if they were the same issue of the reason why they were off. If they said headache week one, tummy ache week two, brain wrist week three, I would treat them as short-term absences. So again, you know, it, it, from those who've listened to me before will know that we have to, I'm very keen to have some flexible boundaries where we have to have some management discretion in there. But definitely look at these clusters because you don't want somebody sitting in there with actually a medical consideration that you as an employer need to look at that sits under the four weeks and you don't pick that up. So we need to pick that up. Um, the other thing in long-term absence, uh, so Carol just gone back to that, we would look um, at that in the investigation in the game if appropriate. Yeah, definitely, Carol, that's great. Yeah, definitely do that. So we need to look at things. Is it a disability or is it one off? For example, if somebody has their appendix out and they have six weeks off, um, that wouldn't be classified as a disability and that would be a one off. Hopefully you would deal with that. And what can you do? Somebody's got appendicitis. There's no issue there or I wouldn't feel an issue. Um, there might be other considerations you can do that I'm going to come into lately to work throughout that absence. Um, but that's a one-off, and it's hopefully, well, it can't happen again. We only have one set of appendices. Um, but um, we need to really consider that. If it's somebody else who has a, a bigger disability, what's that going to mean to the business? Um, and, and these are the considerations that we need to make. So when I talk about the Disability Discrimination um, Act, and, and I thought it was a very um, a good idea at this point to point out of what is a disability under the Act. And the Act does say that if you're disabled, you will have a physical or mental impairment that has a substantial and long-term negative effect on your ability to do normal daily activities. So, yeah, a bit jargony there. And as the government are great at doing, give us some terms in there that you can't fully define, and we have to wait for case law to back that up. So what is substantial? Substantial and what is long term? Well, there's um, various ranges in there that I say I'm not going to go into the masses of the legalities in it, but we have to consider this. And I think in a tribunal situation, if you were brought to that in a challenge under the DDA, um, you, the kind of default would be that they are um, disabled and you need to look to prove that they're not um, and why that they're not. So, um, what is substantial? And what is long-term? I usually take long-term of, of having an effect of over 12 months, and the impairment has to really affect those normal daily activities. But what are normal daily activities? You know, does that mean at work? Does it mean at home? You've got to look into this. But it's something that we must do, because this is the legal pitfalls. Um, as we know, no cap on um, discrimination, um, unfair um, dismissal and discrimination claims, so uh, for discrimination claims, and that's where you see the big books coming through in tribunal awards. So it's something we cannot ignore. Um, I'm also very, very big on a lot of the law is sensible. Um, I'll say a lot. I'll definitely not say all of it because some of it drives me mad. Um, but most of it is common sense. So really, we, you know, if somebody's got a disability, but they have great skills for the business. Shouldn't we help them get around that and make some adjustments? So, for example, if somebody loses a leg and is in a wheelchair, but they're actually a great IT programmer, can we look to make sure that they can get their wheelchair into the build building? Because um, why wouldn't we? You know, they've got great skills. We want them in the organization. And also what's fair as well, even if they haven't got great skills, but they're doing the job the way we want it to do, because we should be managing our staff up to those acceptable levels, then we still want this person in the business. So a lot of it's common sense. Um, the requirements for that there that say that um, we it's unlawful for us to discriminate, um, and that includes failing to comply with the duty to make reasonable adjustments, like getting a wheelchair into the business, etc., um, bigger font size on computers. If anybody has um, 
an eyesight problem, hearing loops, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, those reasonable adjustments will obviously depend on your business and what's reasonable for you. Another nice piece of legislation that doesn't give it in black and white, and we have to refer it to ourselves. Um, but also very key in there, and I think that's something that we forget in managing the absence, is this disability-related harassment, and that is what we need to consider as well for long-term absences to be able that people don't feel vulnerable and harassed in that area. Now, I wanted to mention in the presentation um, about physical and mental health. Um, it's obviously really unfortunate, I think, in society that there is still a stigma about mental health. Um, you know, even in the massive leaps and bounds that that, um, that sector has, has developed itself and the support that's available, there is still a stigma. You know, I see it a lot in um, general work in, work in life. Um, more so, I think, that people who suffer from mental health feel that they can't bring it to people's attention um, as for fear more than anything else, whether that's justified fear or not justified fear, I'm not too sure, and it depends on circumstances. Um, I also see general in practice that mental health is still a bit scary to manage. Um, and lots of people shy away from it because it's a bit of an unknown and think that comes back to we are people and we, some people are quite scared of it themselves and to have it at work is a weird thing. The other thing, that's a massive scale. You know, one thing, you can look at depression. Is depression a de disability or not? Well, you can't just say the word depression means disability because there's a massive scale of depression. There's people, you know, who might be feeling a bit down and there's people who literally can't move because their body is just they're so depressed that they have no control over some bodily functions so there's a massive scale in there and we do sometimes get a bit scared i think we also get scared because that's i'll mention stress in this as well you know stress is something stress is positive we've given a society a negative label to stress because we say um um that um Stress is bad. Well, that stress is not. We need stress to get out of bed in the morning. We need stress to go to get something to eat, to drink, or whatever, um, to go to the toilet. We need stress in our life. It's when it becomes too much that's a problem, and it's pointing out of where that line goes. But I do peop have people that will, um, you know, not manage people with stress, etc. Um, I went to an organisation again. A, a lady had, um, she'd actually been invited to a capability. Um, management meeting and went off sick the next day and stayed off when I um, was called in to help with that situation. She'd been off for about six weeks and they thought, we, we can't speak to her now, she's off sick with stress. Um, no, you can um, because we still need to resolve this and there's case law to suggest in that um, area that if somebody if the stress is the capability meeting and then disciplinary procedures it's actually more fair for the organization to have that and get it out of the way to remove the cause of the stress so we can still manage them we don't have to stand right back and think <gasps> stress somebody you know dare not go near them but i think that's the key time of take some advice and really support managers in dealing with any mental health issues um just reading a comment that we have long-term sickness relating to mental health, so the company has supported us as leaders and send us... An yeah, brilliant. Yeah, absolutely. We do need more support. Um, Organisations and managers, we can't be expected to know all the ins and outs of this and our obligations, but also not just our legal obligations, but morally, you know, how to deal with people. We're not all experts in mental health. So that's brilliant of sending on courses with MIND because, you know, you, you, if you look at statistics, one in three people will suffer from some sort of mental illness. So we're going to come across it in an organisation. Um, Carol, just you know, I think part of it is because you can't measure mental. Yep, absolutely. And doctors don't help in my experience. We always try to keep in touch in the same way as we would with anyone else. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it, it's it's the same thing. It's it's an illness, so we have to treat them all the same. Um, but yeah, I agree with doctors because you know, I did always say I could possibly go to the doctors tomorrow and get a sick note for stress. Um, <laughs> well, I won't. But well, I don't know. I might. Um, no. But, you know, doctors, I think, are getting better. There was a couple of years ago, it was a nightmare. I found it. it was so easy to get a sick note for stress. I think doctors are smartening up a little bit, but it's still something there. And because it isn't measurable, because you can't see it, it's not a broken leg, it's hard to understand. And I think people as well who haven't been in it before can be shocked by it, try and cover it up, and other people might not understand what it feels like. And the old things of, you know, depression, just pull yourself together and get back to work. It ain't going to work. 
So something to bear in mind, I wanted to touch on that just to make sure we all are covering mental health and we don't just um, step away from that too. I absolutely love that um, about getting mind involved um, to bring awareness to uh, to managers. So how are we going to manage this long-term um, absence? Now, um, great there. A few people have mentioned in the chat about staying in touch. It is so much um, of a barrier to overcome if somebody's on a long-term absence, if they've never had any communication with work. And getting through that de- that door after being off work, um, both physically and mentally, is a massive challenge. So the more you can stay in touch with people without harassing them, you know, you've got to weigh this up per um, situation. But I think it's very clear to say we will stay in touch with you. And it just has to be, you know, um, I've sometimes said to people to have a meeting, um, just a welfare meeting, no forcing people to come to work, etc. just to see how they were, they are, show a face, um, see if any support that um, you want um, to give, um, and keep in touch. You know, you can ask the, the person who's ill, do they want to come in the office to keep in touch if they're physically able or mentally able? Do they want to meet at their house or do they want to meet on mutual ground you know meet in a cafe or wherever that will suit the person um but you need to keep in touch if there is a point where the disability obviously won't or the the illness won't let you do that when you have to um look at that but really in reality how many can you not do that it's important to just have that conversation even if it's having a conversation with a family member you need to keep in touch that's really important um, just reading a little bit on the chat, Sharon, mind to come to our offices on the 24th of May to promote Mental Health Awareness Week. Brilliant. Love it. Um, Margaret, GPs often agree with employees that they aren't up to attending meetings. Um, well, I'm going to come to that. I'm requesting a medical report. Um, I'm Obviously, in some experiences, they will, and it will depend on the, the GP. But as so we've got case law to back that up now to say that it's important to get that out of the way um, if that's a cause of stress, um, if it was a stress-related incident. So we've got that in our back pocket, the case law of what's normal. I think GPs are getting better because they've been tackled on this quite heavily. But I think that if you write for a medical report, we need to be very clear in what we want to ask in the questions. So I'm very specific when I send that out. So give some background, you know, in your letter, um, and, you know, happy to speak to anybody offline about this if they need some support in it, because it is something that they've had quite a bit of experience to. So if you're writing for a medical report, and I would perhaps look in your policy, I've I've put a few options there um, about refer to occupational health or request a medical report, It would be good to define in a policy something quite structured so nobody feels unfairly treated. So you might actually put, okay, if you've been off sick four weeks, you fall into the long-term category, we will refer you to occupational health. You may have one internally. There's so many consultancies out there now that can offer this service to you that we may have it. Or it might be after four weeks we request a medical report or after six weeks we request a medical report. I think those two things are really important because you need the information in front of you. So when I request a medical report, I make very clear this person has been off absent from X to present. Um, This is the reasons on the sick note. This is the person's job. Could you please answer the following questions? And I would put in there, you know, if there is a meeting that they don't want to have or they don't want to keep in touch with you, you could you, you need to obviously think of your terminology that you use in there. Remember, this is about restoring um, attendance to an acceptable level. You want to get this person back. You want to support them. So that's got to be reflected in the letter of what's coming through. Um, and clearly st- st- um, stipulate the question. So is, do you consider this person um, to have a disability under the Disability Discrimination Act? You can ask the GP that, you know, or the consultant, whoever they're seeing say they do this work and they're telling me they can't do this element of it do you agree what is your prognosis how long do you think this will last and really be in depth on those questions that you ask because if you just write to somebody and say this person's been off sick can you tell me what's wrong with them and what you think the future will be you're not going to get your answer so we, we can be really specific and I actually think that the reports that I get back that the GP's have a preference for something more structured in there that my dealings with it that they can look through that and see exactly what you want to know so think very clearly on your medical request Um, I'll just go back to the uh, chat Um, Carol one of our ladies is very nervous returned to work after maternity and she has no one else yeah getting through the door 
after being off for such a long term is a massive barrier. And that's, I think, part of the reason with maternity leave is to use those kit days, the keeping in touch days, um, because being out of the office is massive, a big hurdle to get through the door. Um, Should we pay a full salary somebody who works? Oh, sorry, that's gone down. We need to go back up there, Richard, please. I can't read the question now because you moved down. <laughs> Sorry. Let me just look back to one of our ladies. Very, uh, so should we pay full salaries to someone who works part-time from home due to sickness? <gasps> Interesting one. What value are you getting out of it? Um, I would say what is fair um, of, of what you're getting back from it. It's a brilliant solution, and you want to encourage somebody to do that because it's – and when I come in to the next part, um, I will pick on this a little bit more um, to say that, well – you know, you're getting something back here. What is best? Have somebody back part-time and reward them for the output that they're doing or have them sat at home and you could be paying sick pay anyway. So we've got to really look at that um, of what's best. But I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit more shortly. Um, Debbie, can we refer to occupational health or request medical reports without consent? I have someone who has a long bouts of short-term sick and several bouts of long-term sickness and they've refused occupational health or any other help. Is there something I can um, enforce? No, you can't get a report with having their, without having consent. Um, you could refer, refer them to occupational health and make an appointment and if they don't attend. Um, so you can do the referral to occupational health without their consent. It's always best to have it. Um, they can then choose not to go though. Um, but you can't get a medical report without having their consent because the, the medical practitioner will need a si- the original signed copy of their consent form. Um, that would tell me an awful lot, and in these situations, it would only be fair and, as an employer to be making a decision on the information you have in front of them. So I would make it very clear to that person that, look, I want to help you. We want to get, you know, support you back to work and, and look at this attendance, see what we can do. Our way of doing this is to get a medical report for those reasons. Um, and that's all we want to gain out of it. You, they can look at it first if they choose to do so. Um, so it's completely transparent. Um, if they still refuse, you can only manage that person on the information you have in front. So how can you be expected to make any decisions um, that, that that would give you, for example, them a right to reasonable adjustments, et cetera, if you don't have the information? And I would be quite clear to point out that if you don't allow us to get this information that we only want to help you, how can we... Um, how can we help you and how can we make decisions on this? So I'd be pointing that out very clear to that employee. I'd refer them to occupational health, see if they turn up, um, and but I would again ask for the medical report. If they refuse the medical report, go to occupational health. Hopefully you'll get some information from there. If they refuse both, I would be looking at just making decisions on what I've got in front of me. Um, well, Matt, a worker who is pregnant has been on stress leave for about 10 weeks. What do you suggest? It would depend whether the stress leave is related to the pregnancy or not. Um, obviously, we cannot discriminate um, on anything that's pregnancy related. So if the sick note with the stress says it's pregnancy related stress, then unfortunately there um, isn't a massive amount that you could do at that point. Perhaps um, have a meeting with them to investigate the sources of the stress and look to resolve those. Um, but in terms of actually managing the absence, she, that lady would have protected rights. If it's general stress, then I would be following the same procedure, referral, if you had um, you know, requesting a medical report, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but initially, that keeping in touch is your fact find to say, you know, where is your stress? Is it at work? Is it at home? What is any steps we can put in there to relieve that? So um, I would firstly want to know, is it pregnancy related, is it not? And then look at a strategy to include that from then on. Um, okay, right, back to the slides there. Um, when people are ready to come back, I would definitely suggest a phased return. That goes back to it's really hard to break that barrier to come back to work physically and mentally. You know, it can take its toll if you've been sat, you know, resting for six months because of some illness and then suddenly you've got to get up at seven o'clock every day. It's hard. It's hard to get out. I struggle to get up at seven o'clock and I do it every day. Um, but it's hard. So we've got to think about that. Also, you don't want to overload people. So think about that phased return. 
again, I wouldn't set it in, in stone of how people return because that's going to be agreement with you and the person. Now, you may choose to use annual leave to support this. For example, if somebody's been off for six months, they've accrued annual leave for that time. So you may use the annual leave as a, as a, a way to support that back, which helps the organisation because they're using some accrued leave. It helps the employee because they're actually getting paid full-time when they might be coming back part-time and taking annual leave for the rest of it. Take medical advice on this as well. So when you request a medical report, you can ask a doctor if they um, if they if they come back, what sort of re phase return would you suggest? Um, yeah, so it's hard enough after a two week holiday, Carol, to return to work definitely. So after being off longer, you can see how hard it is. Um, so we need to think about phase return. Another thing in there is think about your payment policy. So for those of you who pay company sick pay, we kind of set an acceptable level. Now, statutory sick pay runs for six months, and that is a general, you know, if somebody's off long term, if we were wanting to manage somebody out of the business on capability, it's hard to do that before the statutory um, period of six months because we've kind of set these levels to say what we would tolerate as businesses. If as a company you pay company sick pay for a year, in effect you're saying you can be off sick for a year. So I would find it really difficult to terminate somebody's employment before that year because your policy says I'll pay you for a year. So we kind of think it's acceptable. So be very careful about your payment policy in there of how you actually use that and implement it and what it would mean for the business. Now, it might be all very well, and you might be ha happy to support somebody off on long-term sick for a year, but just bear in mind what that would mean in managing a an absence. Um, okay. So let's look at some strategies um, and possible outcomes that we've got at the end. Um, as I said, what we're looking through in all of this is to return, somebody to return to work at the, the you know, acceptable levels, bring it that way. So hopefully long-term success um, will end in a phased return and somebody return fully fit. That's our ultimate goal. That's what we want to get to. That isn't always possible, so we've got to look at other things. So taking into account the DDA, we could look at redeployment or retraining for another role. So, for example, if somebody did a very manual job in a warehouse lifting and they had a long-term shoulder injury and they couldn't do that any longer, we might look, is there an admin function that they could go into? Only if they've got the skills and abilities to do the role. We don't have to create roles for long-term absences just to get them back and put them in a role that they actually can't do. One, it's no good to them. Two, it's definitely not good to the business. Um, so we don't have to make something up for somebody. It's got to be a value, and that would be a very reasonable thing for us to, a position for us to come through as an organization. We might look to these reasonable adjustments to the environment or the duties. So again, if it was, um, uh, you know, somebody had, was in a wheelchair or had, um, um, you know, IBS and needed to sit near the toilet so they could get there, um, in time, we can quite easily make these adjustments. Again, what's reasonable depends on the size of your organization, what you do, the um, money that it's going to cost, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so there's a lot of things that fall into reasonable. But we could look to do some of those. We ultimately want to get people back. Now, um, this agreed the permanent temporary change to work now, as it falls into the question that I did answer about people working from home in that time. Now, I'd by far for their sake and the organization's sake, have somebody work in some either temporary changes to working hours or permanent to get them back to work. So if somebody, um, you know, I use the appendicitis thing, or if somebody's had an operation, they can't drive for six weeks. But actually after two weeks, they, 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 they're finding themselves and they're actually sitting at home getting a bit bored. And uh, they want to know what's going on and they want to do some work. We have to think of this flexible working because um, it brings so many benefits. And things like this tie you in with loyalty to people and um, you know, have um, promote our brand as a good employer. So in that case, um, you know, somebody's um, had an operation, can't drive for six weeks, so can't get to work, but they're fine after two weeks to work. Give them a laptop. You know, see what they can do. If they not don't qualify for company sick pay, I would look to pay them for the output of what they do. Now it's a bit harder to manage, and you've got to have some trust in there. And it's like anything of managing flexible workers or home workers. Um, look at more output than presenteeism of what we can do. But at the end of the day, you're getting something back. It's brilliant. You're tapping into these skills. 
it may be that you allow somebody you know to to work part time in the office that they can get in there because they're going to get tired quickly and they just want to do that temporary change you might also have to look at that permanent change. Now, again, the permanent change only if it fits to the organization. Let's not be creating roles around people. We want to make sure the role is viable. So if you can do that or somebody can only come back part-time and there's a job share possibility, let's use these things. We want to get these skills back in our organization. If all else fails, we have got to look at the termination route. Now, that could be um, an early ill health retirement, depends, you know, looking at whatever pension schemes that you offer. Some of them have that, that facility within them. Or we might be looking at an ill health termination. Again, something that um, can be dragged on, like my example of the employee who'd worked there for four years, because we can be a bit scared of doing that because we don't want to um, worry ourselves about it. We've always got settlement agreements um, if we choose to go down that route. But it is a fair dismissal to be able to terminate somebody's employment due to ill health of an extended period of time. Again, it wouldn't be if you tried to do that after somebody had been off for two months and you pay six, sick pay for six months. Um, so there's a lot of things that come into there. Um, so we've got to really look at each individual case, but let's not be scared of it. It's a last resort, but it is something that we need to use. I always give an example that, you know, if a fireman lost his leg and he couldn't climb a ladder, he can't do the job. And that's perfectly justified to terminate that. Obviously, we look at any reasonable uh, um, retraining or redeployment somewhere, you might be able to work in the office, etc. We'd exhaust all of those opportunities. But at the end of the day, that doesn't work for him or for you, and you haven't got those. It's a fair would be. I'd like to you know put my neck on the line and say that would be a fair termination. So don't be afraid that when we get to make these very hard decisions to actually make them, but let's make sure that we do um, exhaust all those avenues first. Now, this is actually the, the same, um, more or less the same slide as I had on last week, and I just want to end on this point um, about this attendance culture, because this is critically clear in any sort of absence. And even somebody who's got a, a medical issue that causes a, a, you know, a genuine medical issue Having an attendance culture where people want to be there and they have pride in work, what the, the, in, in the work that they do, they agree working together, they know they're in a supportive team, they care about the people that they work with and the environment, they know that they're getting feedback and reward and all these things for the job that they do, that gives you that attendance culture and we want people to want to come back. When there's long-term absence, there's so many barriers to not coming back. You know, it's difficult for a start, physically and mentally. They might still be ill. They've got to, you know, get themselves well. Having that culture in place is going to have massive impact. And that's next week, more of what I'm going to talk to you about being proactive and what we can do about that. Um, just go back to uh, the chat box. I've terminated somebody and it was actually in their interest as they were able to tap into retrain other benefits. Yeah, I've had a similar quite recently of um, somebody who went on to statutory sick pay and they had a meeting with a benefits um, advisor and they actually said, please, can we, we leave now? We had to make sure it was done legally so we had no comeback on us um, and fairly um, and really protect the company's interest even though that person had, had asked to. But in some cases, people actually, it's better for them. So we need to see that. Um, Margaret, I agree with Carol. Often employees welcome this but won't leave of their own accord because it will affect their benefits. I think there's two things on there. Affecting the benefits so people don't leave, but also they feel like, oh, you know, I'm, I'll be bad. I've been off sick for, a month, for six months and you've paid me. I feel awful resigning. Um, and I have come across that too. So that's why communication and, the, you know, keeping in touch is absolutely critical and having open and honest discussions. Okay. So we've had quite a lot of questions as we go through. I know I have um, gone on. Anybody knows me? Richard Starks at the bidding and says, Joanna, I'll be talking for about half an hour. You all know that ain't true because I, <laughs> I struggle to keep that in there. Um, so we've got a little bit over. But if anybody has any further questions, um, we're going to end the recording now.